All right, thank you. Um, you're hearing me, right? Yes, good. I'd like to just first uh, very quickly thanks for inviting us to participate and to um, and to be a part of this. And thanks to the previous speakers who outlined the, the, the framework within which this conference is going to be done. And I will not um, repeat that at all, because I think that what, what you've done just now is to speak very eloquently about what we have been doing Actually, one of the reasons for us joining this conference was exactly to speak about what we have not yet done. Because for us, it is important that this restitution debate also emerges with a certain kind of humility as cultural institutions to realize that there is much to be done, but much that we have not yet done. And that also that there is we are also complicit in the not doing of certain things. So what I hope to learn, and we hope to learn from our own institutions, even though we've been involved in this conversation for a while, is how do we imagine different kind of futures, mobilizing those outside of us who've been doing hard work, actually in critique of our institutions and our national governments about what we've not yet done. I look forward to these three days. But right now it is not for me to speak. It is for a wonderful speaker who I've engaged with only briefly recently to try and prepare, Noella um, Kahanu, um, a native Hawaiian who has 15 years, a veteran of the Bishop Museum in Honolulu, um, where Noella has developed sort, scores of exhibitions and programs. She worked on the renovation of the Hawaiian Hall, the Pacific Hall and the landmark Iku Anaka, Faya, and I hope my pronunciation is really bad, and Noella, you can help me with that, exhibitions. Noella has a law degree from the University of Hawaii um, at um, um, Manoa, where she currently serves as an associate specialist in public humanities and native Hawaiian um, programs. And I'm very interested actually in this idea of museums of, as public humanities institution and what role they play in thinking through some of the urgent questions that restitution places on the agenda. Noella has over 25 years of experience with repatriation, reburial re matters, and recently assisted with the return of ancestral remains from Germany and England. Her current research and practice explore the liberating and generative opportunities when museums cede authority, and that we will speak to later on as well. One of the most energetic and insightful conversations we've had more recently um, is when Noella spoke to me about the agency that objects have on us in terms of pushing us to think around certain kind of historical pain. We look forward to Noella's presentation. I will not say anything, but afterwards I will ask a few questions. Noella, welcome. And I hope you have the energy because three o'clock in the morning is early <laughs> or late. Aloha, nope. everyone. Um, thank you so much for this opportunity to address you all. And mahalo to Wayne for that wonderful introduction. In 2014, a Hawaiian law professor was sitting under a stand of keawe trees on an ancient battlefield. A warm ocean breeze blew across the arid rocky shoreline. She was waiting for her students who had gone on a huaka'i or brief walk with another professor. As she sat there alone, a woman and a company of men approached her from some 50 yards away. As they got closer, she noticed they were dressed in traditional fashion, wielding weaponry, and that she was no longer in the present. Within those moments, she had been pulled back in time nearly two centuries to 1819, to the famous Battle of Kuomo'o, where the fate of the kapu system hung in the balance. And as the fighting raged around her, she saw that the high chief Kekuo Kalani, whose name meant the backbone of the heavens and who had been entrusted to protect the feathered war god and the religion of countless generations had fallen. He who had defended the faith of his Akua his chiefly gods, was mortally wounded. Malia sensed his overwhelming grief and sorrow, that in failing to protect the gods, he had failed all who came before and who would come after. What 
would become of a people with no spiritual foundation? Could they survive? And in the midst of his despair, his wife Manono reached into the future and pulled Malia to them. And what they saw through Malia was that the Hawaiian people would survive and that we would be strong and resilient. And with this knowledge, Kekuo Kalani was able to pass in peace. Manono grabbed her spear and returned to the battle. Malia felt an overwhelming sense of aloha, of love. And she heard these words, malama ko aloha, remember our aloha. As long as you remember us, have love for us, we will always be here, just as you have been here for us. In this mo'olelo, as told by University of Hawaii, Professor Malia Akutagawa, the va, the space-time continuum had compressed itself into a singular moment when the past and the future came together. She summed up her story, what we do in this life heals the pain of the past. This story shook me to my core, to my now, and has stayed with me ever since. What does it mean that by our actions today, we can heal the pain borne by those who came before us? Can we actually undo historical trauma? Is this what we mean when we pursue pono or the Hawaiian concept of justice, of balance? As Kanaka Oivi, as Native Hawaiians, we believe our mana resides within our bones, our iwi, burial within the bosom of Haumea, the earth, enables this mana to return and sustain future generations. Yet tens of thousands of Hawaiian burials have been disturbed over the last two and a half centuries as a consequence of the doctrine of discovery of colonization, savage ethnology and archaeology, scientific racism, medical research, tourism, militarism, and commercial development. As we engage with museums in a colonial context, we face the reality that historical trauma and contemporary trauma coexist because the result of, of that heva, the wrongfulness of the original theft, persists. Yet in the moment of theft are the seeds of their return sown. It is as though the fate of our ancestors is directly tied to our consciousness today. Said another way, is our contemporary liberation intertwined with the original Heva, such that only by our actions today can the past be can the pain of the past be undone? In the decades of my work with, in, and around museums, I have seen the agency and activism of our ancestors. I have borne witness to an exhibition that should have taken a decade. And it took just a few years to bring the three great Ku temple images to Bishop Museum. I have seen cases that lasted decades be resolved in a matter of months. And beyond all odds, I have seen the chiefly adornments of a li'i nui kalani opu'u that were once gifted to Captain Cook return home permanently. Yet these are the exceptions. Many, many more await in the shadows, in the closed stacks and darkened cabinets for their homecoming or Ivi Kupuna, whose long sleep was disturbed, they agitate for their own return. For those of us whose research takes us into the archives and libraries and museum repositories, we are exposed to their ire and emotion. From an indigenous perspective, we must understand that provenance research is not just research about past transactions. It reopens old wounds. It re-exposes our kupuna to the heva of this past and their shame at no longer being lovingly enfolded in kapa or hinai, woven baskets 
but naked, boxed, and shelved shelves. It exposes us who seek their return to their anger and grief and to our own shortcomings for our failure to bring them home. After all, the burdens of these past wrongs are not only borne by the individuals and institutions who participated in these colonial thefts, but also by Hawaiians today who are engaged in the work of restitution. Prayers help us to process the impacts of these connections. In a mai ko'oko inaina me komako ha'aha. Let your anger be appeased by our humility this day. Look with favor upon us. Grant us life and awaken within us the true depth of this work. Perhaps the most difficult uh, case at the moment is that concerning the collections of Edward Arnie. From 1884 to 1886, while working for the Kingdom of Hawaii to treat those afflicted with Hansen's disease, Arning amassed a collection of hundreds of cultural items, as well as dozens of iwi kupuna. Our work has met reading translated essays where Arning freely admits to stealing the soft kapa coverlet from a child's remains and taking skulls from graves and burial caves separating them from their bodies, their families, and their communities. He knowingly did so without consent and against Hawaiian beliefs, laws, and practices. Indeed, in 1860, the Kingdom of Hawaii had en enacted a law for the protection of places of sepulture, which made it illegal to dig up, disinter, remove, or convey away any human body from any burial place absent legal authority. Codified as chapter 61 of the penal code, punishment was either imprisonment at hard labor for not more than two years or by a fine not exceeding $1,000. Nonetheless, in an effort to learn more about the disease, Arning also exhumed the remains of at least two patients from their resting places in Kalabao, Molokai. He wrote from Honolulu that not being able to acquire the desired corpse here, I went to Molokai and there succeeded in procuring part of the body of a tubercular case of leprosy, which had been buried there for three months. He exhumed another patient one year later after their death, disturbing their moi loa, their long sleep, and once again subjecting them to scrutiny, desecration, and dehumanization. His actions were closely followed by Native Hawaiians and reported in the Hawaiian language newspaper, Keola o Hawaii, on March 22, 1884. That Arning was brought to the Kingdom of Hawaii to address these medical matters makes it no less insidious that he took advantage of this opportunity while in Hawaii to pilfer other graves and steal iwi kupuna and their belongings is undeniable. One of Arning's most egregious acts was to petition for the commutation of the death sentence of a Hawaiian man named Keanu so that he could be used as a research test subject, intentionally inoculating him with leprosy in 1884. Within the archives of the Hawaiian Historical Society, I came across a photo of Keanu taken by Arning. I had seen portions of it before, headshots, I suppose. But in this particular photograph, he stood completely nude, arms at his side, looking straight into the camera unflinch unflinchingly. A few photographs later, I found a 12-year-old Hawaiian girl posed nude in much the same way. These acts of dehumanization where Hawaiians were treated as test subjects, as less than human, live on beyond the page. Like our Ivi Kupuna, the heva lives on in those who are exposed and who feel the anguish. I call this archival trauma. In their effort, to make us aware 
They seek those who are able to hear their call and we feel their burden and share their pain. What do we as Kanaka Oivi do with this information? Does this provenance research help us to restitute the 23 ancestral Hawaiian remains taken by Arni that still remain in Germany? And what of the at least 18 biological specimens consisting of organs, brains, spinal cords, and extremities, which have yet to be located? And what of those items taken from burial sites, such as the child's kappa, or the elderly woman's stone mirror, or even the goddess Kihavahine, who was remo removed from a burial niche? Given Arning's own admissions, and the documentation that surrounds him, are there not compelling ethical issues that mandate the immediate restitution of these Ivi Kupuna and other related mea, given this context of injustice? To those that fear the emptying out of museums, I suggest that the goal, the end goal, is to have a collection that museums can be proud of, knowing that what remains was acquired through ethical and moral means. In the publication, Old Hawaii, Adrian Kepler notes that we are indebted to Edward Arning for making this outstanding collection and his tireless research in Hawaii. Indeed, this tremendous ethnographic collection and Arning's accompanying catalog reveals much about the life of 19th century Hawaiians. As budding kappa practitioners, my daughter and I revel in his detailed descriptions of the art of kappa making. And yet such information was kept from the Hawaiian community for well over a century until the publication and the translation of Old Hawaii in 2008. While we are grateful for the provenance and other detailed information that Arning's collection now provides us, such gratitude does not mean that we cannot simultaneously contest, contest his research and theft of our ancestral bodies, knowledge, and remains. When language barriers prevent indigenous communities from fully accessing museum records regarding ancestral human remains, as in the instant case, it is imperative that museums aid in the translation of key documents that may shed light on the manner of collection and acquisition. To do otherwise is to leave in place colonial mechanisms that oppress and exact harm by continuing the intentional separation of ancestral remains from their living descendants. Only with full knowledge gained from provenance research that is shared by both the museums and indigenous communities can we ever hope to move beyond the past and into the present and future. Within the United States, the Native American Grave Protection and Repatriation Act forced museums to the table regarding the return of Indian, Alaska Native and Native Hawaiian ancestral remains. Yet no such law exists in an international context. We are instead left to letter writing, to emails, to finding friends or friends of friends who can translate our words into German, French and Russian. Often these efforts are met with silence with some cases going on for years or others, such as those in Germany for decades. Yet re we rely on our persistence and our aloha, which has enabled us to be powerful advocates for our ancestors by opening up, opening up connections and establishing relationships with people such as Philip Schorsch. Our kupuna have taught us that the brilliance of aloha is more than love and compassion. It means being honest and open and willing to develop a relationship despite past harm. Two recent international restitutions stand out, one from the Free State of Saxony in 2017 and one from the Duckworth Laboratory at the University of Cambridge in 2020. As a matter of principle, these are usually closed processes, even to those who may have helped to facilitate the return. The extent of cooperation is to coordinate the time, place, and manner and transfer so that we can liberate 
or EV kupuna from the clutches of colonial institutions. After all, up to that point, contact between Hawaiian organizations and these museums were likely contested and hostile. But over the last several years, there has been a sea change. We have shared meals, embraced and shed tears and beers with those whose institutions once slammed doors in our faces, who held our ancestors captive for well over a century. Top governmental and university officials have offered their apologies in public and private settings and admitted to theft in press releases issued nationally and globally. There is a danger to romanticizing this work and not fully comprehending the burdens that come from uncovering the often ugly truth of acquisition. Yet the work has also been profound and the relationships formed have been enduring and life-changing with Hawaiian advocates and European museum officials and scholars continuing to host one another abroad. These changes came about in part because of a willingness to open up this process of healing, the transfer of ancestral remains, their release and the start of their homecoming to governmental, university and museum representatives. More importantly, it was an opportunity for these officials to address the Ivi Kupuna in their presence and to offer their apologies said Professor Stephen Toop, Vice Chancellor of the University of Cambridge, I am grateful for the opportunity you have given us to repair the damage caused by some of our own ancestors. To your kupuna, I say, I am sorry that your voyage home has been so long interrupted, but I hope you may now travel back in peace. Remarked well-known Hawaiian repatriation advocate Edward Haleoloha Ayao. Today, humanity wins. There is a well known Hawaiian phrase, ikava mamua, ikava mahope. Some liken it to walking backwards into the future. Says scholar Lilikala Kame'elehiva, it is as if the Hawaiian stands firmly in the present with his back to the future and his eyes fixed upon the past, seeking historical answers for present day dilemmas. Such an orientation is to the Hawaiian an eminently practical one, for the future is always unknown, whereas the past is rich in glory and knowledge. But what if that past is also filled with trauma and grief? Moreover, ikava mamua, ikava mahope, with its directional locative use, implies the centrality of the speaker. It is as if we are the only ones reaching, looking, grasping, yearning. Maybe we have this all wrong. And as I reflect on the nature of indigenous temporalities, I'm taken back to the battlefield of Kuomo to Malia's summation that what we do in this life heals the pain of the past. If we are looking to the past, are our ancestors not simultaneously looking forward into the future? For the va cannot be activated only by one side. It is a space of mutuality and activation and generative possibilities that is found often within a museum context. It is a space where historical trauma coexists in both the past and present, but can be healed through a process of intergenerational aloha. Ma lama ko aloha. This is the true nature of restitution work. This is the true nature of your work. That by our actions today, we ease historical trauma. And this healing, it is not merely theoretical. It manifests within the lifetime of the one who is harmed. Because in the heva of their desecration is born the seeds of their return. And they are able to leave Hawaii knowing that we will bring them home someday. The distance 
between the original Heva and their return can be measured in the time it takes us to awaken to our own consciousness and to understand that there is no better definition of sovereignty than the return of our ancestors to the sands of their birth because therein lies the cycle of mana and interdependency that ensures our survival into the future. Therein lies the path to Pono. Ina kupuna o Hawaii mai kamanava o wakea aia manava. Ke kune mako ma kapo o hivio papa. Ua hanao ya mako maya papa mai a ho i ho ya papa. Na mako e malama ina ivi o ko mako kupuna. Na na mo o e malama i ko mako ivi. A ho o mao kalo kahi o kako. No laila e ho mai ka ike e ho mai ka no e ao. E ho mai ke aloha. E ho mai ka i kaika. E ho mai ka no e ao. A mama hua no. To the ancestors of Hawaii. From the time of Wakea to now, we stand on the shoulders of Papa. We were born from Papa and to Papa we return. We will protect the bones of our ancestors and our children will protect our bones. As we continue this interdependency, grant us knowledge, grant us skill, grant us the aloha, grant us the strength. Thus it is finished. Thus it is finished. Mahalo. Noella. <laughs> um, thank you. Um, for a provocative but wonderful presentation, there is so much in it um, that we could have a long discussion about, and unfortunately, we don't have that much time. But but that's fine. That's fine. Um, I I want to enter into a few questions with you and wait for see if there are other questions by others. One of the things that that for me is important in 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 your presentation is the idea of the temporality of current trauma. Right? That you 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 are you are interested in this in this in how time how we understand temporality. And that temporality of current trauma, I think, ties to the conference's de desire to take histories longer, not just to talk about the now, but to take histories longer. So in that temporality, one of the things I found amazing in which you, you opened up where you say, or contemporary liberation is embedded, was actually embedded at that moment, <laughs> was a seed planted at the moment of the taking. Can you can you can you elaborate a little bit on that for me? Because I think that that there is is a fascinating way of thinking about that liberative liberatory possibility that is there in the present. So um, I go back and thank you for that question. Uh, I go back to Malia Akutagawa's story, which is that right kikuokalani cannot die, he cannot release until he is assured of the survivability of his people into the future. So um, the way I think about the theft of ancestral remains in Ivi Kupuna is that they see at the moment of their taking that there will be a time within which they return. And that by doing so, it then, they then allow for that taking, if that makes sense. It is, it is simultaneously both not of their choosing, obviously, and yet it is, it is our, our liberation is bound to their return and their knowledge of that cyclical nature and this interdependency that the, that our fates are intertwined is what um, com com compels me to view things in this fashion. 
Now we can be, uh, <laughs> we can we can come to our own consciousness, but it still requires right the the participation of the holding institutions to 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 participate in the release and return of these ivi kupuna. Um, so I think it remains on us then to to share in this process of what it means to to find the humanity in restitution in a way that heals everyone, including museums. And and I, I really want to hold on to that because one of the things that you you you, you highlighted here and is interested is where you say you, you allude to it here and we spoke about it before that there is a kind of consequence to provenance research that is not equally weighted. Mm. That, that, that there is a different engagement um, by the, even if we are collaboratively involved in this, in thinking past, present and futures, there is something about that unequal weight of, of the trauma that is felt, by, uh, for example, by the indigenous um, 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 researcher who has to engage with these collections. What would you say is the responsibility of us as museums, but also of Larissa and the entire organizational team to be able to account for this, the fact that um, the unequal distribution of mm -hmm. such traumatic engagement with, our, with, our, with the archive? Uh, so I think that it is helpful to be cognizant, first of all, the knowledge, the awareness and knowledge of the, the profoundly traumatic consequences of doing such archival research. And the reason is because, I mean, I think that, you know, we call out to people that we know will respond. Um, collections, Ivi Kupuna, they, they, they function in the same way, um, which is to say that they reach out, sound out, call out to, to those to whom it will be received. And that falls upon the ears of the, their descendants, right? And so, um, you know, I have my, my daughter just started in a museum and it's already happening, you know, and, and, and it's, it's frightening on a, on a certain level. But at the same time, it's like you self-select for this work. You wouldn't enter into this work if you did not know that you ultimately become the conduit for, for those who have been silent for so long. And they sense that your presence is the closest thing that will get them, you know, to, that will free them. So they're, they're going to have expectations. They're going to have um, longings. They're going to have, they're going to be a little, you know, pissed off. Uh, so, I mean, there, there's, so, so all of that energy and anguish and frustration will manifest and will be felt by indigenous researchers and people who, have, who are in proximity to those collections. And so I think it's imperative that, that um, museums understand this and, and seek to take care of those, those indigenous um, people that come to visit their institutions to uh, malama them in ways that acknowledge the, the physical and mental consequences of this work. Uh, Larissa, you had a question. You want to ask your question, and then there's a question from the from the from the public. Yeah. Um, just before uh, we we turn over the to, to the public, Nora, thank you, thank you so much, and also for. Um, for the attempt to familiarize us, you know, with some of the Hawaiian concepts. And, and there is one concept that I'm particularly interested in, and that's Pono um, justice, because we here, we are discussing about colonial injustices and how do you define that and when is it injustice and does then that injustice um, have restitution as a consequence and when does it have consequence? 
I would just be interested, what, what is Pono? I mean, how do we bring about justice and who is it who can bring about justice? And what does justice or the emergence of justice um, depend on um, according you know, to, to Hawaiian views? And can that help us think through the debate and how to go forward in order to create justice, more social justice in this and in other debates maybe even? Thank you. <laughs> mm. Yeah, so thank you for that question. And um, uh, Pono is, is defined in many ways. Uh, in one context, it's about um, righteousness, you know, uamal ke'e o ka'aina i ka'pono. The sovereignty of the land is preserved in righteousness. Um, but it also stands for justice. And, and I, I think of it more in terms of achieving a kind of balance or a holistic um, sensibility so that what was once askew or um, um, broken, right, is, is, is made whole again through um, and it, it often requires like a process. You don't, you don't just, you know, you don't find Pono, right? Mm -hmm. you, 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 you go from a state of Aole Pono or out of, you know, uh, I have a wrongfulness and you move to a place of Pono. So, um, you know, that's why they call it Ho'o Pono Pono, right? This, this, um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, uh, when you're a, attempting resolution of conflict. And that requires the participant, the, the equal active participation of all involved. Um, and, and a surrender to a process. Now, usually for Ho'oponopono, you have like a designated haku, you have somebody who's there who's controlling the process. That's not necessarily. Um, the case in our situations, right? But I, I guess one of the things that I want to suggest is that that our ancestors are an active part of this process of Pono. That we are that and 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 for us to acknowledge their 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 agency and their presence, who is not to say that that they are absolutely the reason why we have been brought together at this moment in time. And ultimately, if there is wrong being done, it is there, there is an obligation to forgive. Uh, and that's probably one of the most difficult things about um, the process of achieving Pono is, is not like laying claim to and, 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 and harboring um, resentment but to 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 um to to express aloha profoundly in all of its manifestations i think you're on mute you, oh yeah, I have so many questions, but there is a question from the public that I wanted to just bring in and uh, it is from um uh, oh yeah, it's going you no know, Mikael. And, and the question is, um, how is the federal state of the United States of America involved in restitution questions to your knowledge? And, or is it just a question concerning Hawaii? Um, or is there a broader conversation that is going on in the US? <clears throat> Thank you for the question. Uh, largely due to the work of Hui Malama Ina Kupuna Ohava Ine, most of, I would say, all known Hawaiian Iwi Kupuna have been returned from national repositories um, because of the, Na the NAGPRA, the National uh, Graves Protection and Repatriation Act. So the question then is, what is left? What remains are those that are really coming from an indigenous, I mean, from an international context. 
Um, there are times in which the federal the assistance of the federal government and the United States have been brought to bear uh, in terms of supporting claims to um, to other governments or to other international institutions. Um, so that but but in essence, their their role, the role of the United States as a government is minimal to non-existence and non-existent when it comes to Hawaiians negotiating directly with international repositories. All right. And, and I think that there was a question from Maria after, which is which which basically asked about NACPRA, and I think you answered it in that. Um, I, I want to just ask you one question because in a in a certain sense, the Aloha and how you speak of Aloha, but but also questions of forgiveness are questions that emerge in from many different places. I can think of the work of Anna Arendt from one side, or the work of um, Ariel Azule more recently, David Scott around the question of forgiveness in in creating these future futures, right? But one of the things that trouble not trouble, I want to ask the question: How do I, as a museum, develop a conversation about future partnership? without patting myself on the shoulder, without side skirting the discussion around the difficult conversation, and, and also without doing just simply saying, but we have been doing that all along. Because mm -hmm. we as museums have been involved in partnership conversation, even outside of the restitution debate. And sometimes we might even use it as a way to sidestep restitution. Or how do we not do that, I want to ask. Right. So that's the, to me, that's the conversation around seeding versus seeding authority. So, you know, this idea of seeding, C-E-D-E, -E, right? That is how museums have typically approached collaborations or consultations in a very um, resentful way. Like, <laughs> we will do it. But, we're, but this is not something we're really comfortable or we really want to do. Versus seeding authority, S-E-E-D, right? Like how can we think about seeding authority in a way that's actually gener generative and truly collaborative and one, one in which we're, we're actively planting together for our, a collective future? And so I, it requires a, 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 a profound mental shift on the part of, of, um, of museums. And this is something um, that was mentioned earlier, uh, I think by, um, by Larissa, that, the, uh, um, that, that restitution is part of the, like that's only the beginning, right? It's not the end. It's the beginning of the relationship, and that is definitely what we saw with with germ with uh, um, with the Dresden case, and it's what we've seen with with the University of Cambridge as well. So, um, <laughs> I mean, think of the colonial beast, right? Like the oldest the oldest institution, educational institution in the world, basically, and. You know, I thought it was like a scene from Harry Potter. They were they were wearing their red, you know, their black cloaks and the coats and their uh, red thing around. And it was because they said it, they only wear those to the most important of events. And it actually showed their protocol that they <laughs> were so profoundly moved and impacted by the inclusion of them in our transfer ceremony and it profoundly impacted them so yeah i think it requires inclusion participation so that we can witness ourselves how we are impacting one another Right, brilliant. Um, Noella, I think we have to come to a close now, but there are so many um, important things that we've discussed. I really am, am amazing the idea that the end goal is not to have, the end goal is to have a collection that one can be proud of. 
<laughs> not to have a collection, <laughs> right? <laughs> so that's a brilliant, <laughs> wonderful, wonderful statement, but also that you challenge us. And I think that this is where we could go as well from your, your, your the legal framework, but even the linguistic framework to, to ask another question about what is necessary for us actually to be able to do the work to reach the next step, which you are suggesting translations or, or and I take translation there not only as language, but translation also to think of it in more complex way as a conceptual argument around law and what is legal. And, and, and so, so it is that bigger picture of translating in between worlds that can help us to, to undo this, this structure of keeping, of taking what you call this, a, a certain kind of scene of the crime. So this has been a wonderful, rich presentation. And, and I must admit that <laughs> that last term of seeding as a space to think how we grow together, something together is an absolutely brilliant way to leave this beginning of the discussion. Thank you for challenging us. Thank you for all of that where we want to go. And I think that this is also the beginning of a longer conversation that we will have. And we feel badly because you need to sleep <laughs> at three o'clock in the morning. Wonderful. Thanks a lot. Mahalo Thank Nui for a wonderful session. So my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, William.